we work on we are interested um, the development in of the eye, but very specifically the molecular the mechanism, mechanism, the development of the lens and the eye by which my lab cells communicate to each other for birth. And, and, and we're working on the underlying uh, causes, causes which now specific genetic causes for uh, set aside aside and progenitors of second lung tissue versus transcription factor, protein, liver tissue, and not regular We want to understand how the interaction of the genes cell type specific gene expression. I, I really just want to know how things work, how, how nature works. That moment where you're looking through the microscope, let's say, and you see something that you think nobody else knows. In my mind, when that happens, that's the single most valuable moment in my career. It is absolutely compelling. It's so interesting what this new piece of data is suggesting. And to be honest with you, that's kind of like a high, and you chase that high. While it didn't change the world or didn't change science, between night and the morning, I was the only person in the world. I knew something no one else knew. I discovered, I a, discovered secret. a secret. Epiphany in my mind, and it could be defined maybe by others in different ways, would be sort of like boom, 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 boom. Eureka, eureka. That's, eureka. That's, it. that's it. This is what we need to do. So I think a lot of times, it's um, letting your mind wander and bringing in different kinds of ideas and then putting them sort of in a melting pot and, and you can then generate what hopefully is this idea. And sometimes it, it can really be like an epiphany when you, uh, it's something you weren't thinking about before and all of a sudden there it is. So maybe this will sounds weird but really I because I really remember, remember the, the, the feeling, the I, feeling got. I got but I felt like exactly when I the feeling when I f fall in love with <laughs> with my first boyfriend some some strange, strange inside, inside and, 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 and excited, excited and, and, and but but you don't don't you don't you control, control anything. anything this was really the feeling of I would say love that's really strange but that's the same feeling like like, yeah, I guess falling in love with science. <laughs> it's also your own discovery about whether you really have the passion for it or not. It's not just the, the thing you see that you realize is some revelation or um, something you just didn't know and all of a sudden you synthesize a thought or a finding. I think it's also about discovering that you have the passion to be a scientist. So my lab does a lot of microscopy. And just in its own right, the embryos, I've worked on fly embryos and fish and frogs and mice, and I think they're all beautiful creatures in their own right. But then we do things where we apply antibodies and fluorescent tags, and then they glow in pretty colors, green and red and blue. And you figure out how to take pictures with them on the microscope. And that's probably what I've done the most of in my whole career, is I've spent many hours in a dark room looking through two uh, oculars of a microscope. I had a 25-year dream to have my own confocal microscope. I got to d design the scope and its settings, and I love to go in there now, and on the computer you can play music while you're in there for many hours, and it's sort of this idea of like being like a casino. We have no clocks in there. So that your, pr your process of investigation and recording your experiment and your discovery you can let it take the path that it needs to. And so you are in a dark space, which has its pluses and minuses, but you're at this piece of equipment that makes the most beautiful images. And um, I just, yeah, my, microscopes are my favorite, but that one in particular uh, is, allows me to do things that I can't do otherwise. From an artistic point of view, neurons are really pretty. They have all these branches and some neurons have uh, on their dendrites, which are the processes that come off the cell body of the neuron, they have these things called spines. And so the spines on the dendrites are really attractive to see these and how they, how, how they populate certain neurons and don't populate the dendrites of other neurons. And the same thing can be said about axons. So they can grow in long distances and they can branch in different ways. And 
you know, you could imagine drawing these as just a kind of a doodle, but these are really what are in brains. Science is a very creative field. I think that the most fulfilled and successful scientists have tapped their creativity. You have to look at what you learn from the literature and from seminars, from what other people tell you about their work and their discoveries, and you're constantly creating new ideas. Sometimes you're creating new technologies, but you're always putting everything together in a new configuration to come out with a new discovery or a new result or a new failure. But it's, it, one of the things that's nice about science is in the true academic setting, you're your own boss. You set the hours, the time, what you work on each day, all of those things contribute to feeling like a creative person. In a way, failure is an integral part of the process. If you think about the scientific method, what you're really trying to do is disprove your idea. And you try as hard as you can, and you can't disprove your idea or your hypothesis, then whatever that hypothesis is, it's, it's sort of like Sherlock Holmes, you know? You, you rule out all of the obvious things, then however improbable, whatever's left has to is the most likely uh, case. The best scientists, in my impression, will have failed, you know, infinitely more times than they will succeed and have succeeded. And it's that failure that actually makes them a really great scientist. What I learned as a student is at least 50% of every experiment will fail. And that's nothing you can do to stop it, and it's as it should be. Because you learn from the failure, it may be a mistake, it may be you dropped something or did something abnormal, it may be that you didn't design the experiment in the best way possible. And so you have to have failed experiments to, to actually get, drive yourself forward to get the ones that do uh, tell you, give you insight. So I think that it, you're taking a risk every time you set up an experiment because of that. You know there's a 50-50 at least chance that nothing will come of it, and you'll be doing it again slightly differently. So that's, uh, that's definitely a part of what we do, and in some ways I think that's really different than what a lot of other endeavors or you know, careers involve. They, you're going to go do something that's essentially the same every day, and there's not so much risk involved. And ours is the risk also of your ego. How many failures can you take, right? So I think that that's absolutely tied up in, in discovery. It's a, it's, a, it's a required part. In science, not much works. I mean, most of science is failure, right? So um, you can't get on some level emotionally involved and you can't take it personally, right? You have to understand that most of what you're trying is not going to work, but really it, it's just about sort of questions and answers and, and the next question that you take. Right? So, for instance, you, if you have an experiment that can give you answer A or it can give you answer B, right? And so it might, might, you know, a failure might be considered answer B, but answer B opens up a new door. You know, failure is inher inherent, but it, as I said, you can't, on some level you don't need to think of it as, as failure. It's just sort of following a road of forks that you take to eventually lead you to you know, some insight or, or some answer. A lot of times you have a, an idea and you test it and it turns out you were wrong. So, in, and then you move on to the next uh, possible explanation. So in a way, that kind of failure is absolutely normal part of the process. And I would think probably most scientists don't see that as failure, but just the, the process. Um, but at the same time, you sometimes get really invested in an idea. Um, you work really hard at something, and it just doesn't work out. And then you, that's much more like a really true failure. You have this idea that, that uh, something would work a particular way, and no matter how much you try to test it, it really doesn't seem to be the, the, that. And so I would say that one of the things that I find characteristic of successful scientists is they have very thick skins. 
and you have to be able to pick yourself up and say, right, all right, that was a complete waste of two years of my life, but now let's carry on. Um, and not everyone can do that. And, and so I think that's an important part of the process. You have to be uh, tenacious and resilient. And so it took me about 10 years to finally convince people and publish the papers that I said that I could do and that I would find the results that I expected to find for people to finally believe that. And so during those 10 years, I wasn't able to get funded. It was very difficult for me to publish papers because the field just wasn't ready to accept that. And so now I'm doing another project that's similar to that um, as far as what people were expecting. It's different from what people were expecting. That was maybe one of the biggest surprises I had when I started doing science, was how much failure there really is. And, you know, a lot of that failure is because we don't have the right technologies or approaches to ask the question. So we're limited by that, and we end up in a scenario where we say, well, this is a really good idea or a really good hypothesis, and this is the best way we can test it, but it still might not be an optimal way to test it. There is no failure in science. There is a result. The result may be positive or negative, may match the hypothesis or may not. It is not a failure. There might be a technical error that we have made, in which case figuring out what that error is is just as much fun as getting an answer and figuring out what to do next. So it's just, it, it is one giant puzzle. There is no failure in science in that sense. Now there are pragmatic concerns about failure. Failure to get funding does affect me. And it affects all of us, and partly that's because our livelihood and that of many other people depends on our ability to get funding. Um, so that does affect me a lot. Maybe I think many people have an impression of a scientist being this kind of uh, deep thought genius type person who just goes, you know, this is it, and then we'll do this and we get that. Um, and it's really not at all like that. The best scientists I know are smart, really smart people. But more than that, if I had to describe them in one word, they would be, they would persevere. That's the most important. In my mind, to be a successful scientist, perseverance is the single most important trait you can have. So I think failure and, and um, problem that we face uh, in science are very important and drive our way of thinking. Um, so yes, it's very frustrating, but it's always making us um, going in new direction and taking risk. I think taking risk is crucial in our for scientists because for me, a scientist should be creative and should not do what other people do. Like we should always go into a new direction. So new direction for me equal taking risk.